in 86 was still, but we were about to get to the end of the, of the DJ kind of being the, the leader per se, because we mm-hmm. had the DJ as the foundation of the culture and was always in front for a long time. And then that started switching around this time. So mm-hmm. how, how do you think, or in your opinion, as somebody that was going through it at the time, how and why do you think that was switching? Because we had Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, we had Eric B and Rakim, we had DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince. We had all these examples, you know, throughout history from the 70s groups to the 80s groups. And then this was kind of the last wave of that for this year, maybe another two years. But as it was happening, what did you see was the change and why? I mean, back like you said the djs always was uh, in control uh, and they, they was the calling the shots so all the mcs you should just do get up there and rhyme so that's like when they be freestyling but the the difference in and in, in changing it the mcs after a while they started taking control you know and, and um i mean i i give take my hat off to like the cold crush brothers grandmaster flat spirits five funky four plus one more and the Crash Crew, those brothers had routines. They, I look at them as as door openings for us, but they was ahead of their time, and they knew how to control the crowd. You know, and, and the change, the change went with the time. Like just like now, they went to CD turntables, so they they went from MC in here, and they took the the. Um, vinyl away and went into the cd turntables but i don't use cd turn i use vinyl there's nothing like feeling that vinyl you know but um yeah it changed it changed okay and then i remember too uh the i'm a host song being so dramatic because (laughs) that was such a, a different way to look at things uh looking at the man like that so do you remember when you guys recording it or the writing of it? Like, whoa, this is, <laughs> what is this? Yeah. I was like, Larry, you crazy. Yeah. And, and he said, no, we're doing this. And they put it out, you know, but that record was number one in, in, in Dallas, Texas. I mean, they booked this for the show. They said, yo, that's the number one song out here. I said, what? Yep. And they just go, I'm a hmm. You know I'm a hmm on the radio. Yeah. Dallas, Texas, man. Wow. And that was also, especially at that time, one of the early uh, examples for Houdini of being a little more, quote unquote, risque, I guess, lyrically. So yes. what what made uh, all you guys and Larry Smith even comfortable to kind of push that boundary? Man, Larry was a guy to take chances. He didn't care. He didn't care. If it sound good and it's bumping and, and the lyrics is there, that's it. He said, let's go with it. Forget it. Let's go with it. Okay. And that became one of my biggest records. No, that, that was a smash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then also on the album was Growing Up, mm-hmm. which, you know, was very uh, positive messages and about not giving up and different things. Um, mm-hmm. And that, that, I think, tied in well to, I think, kind of the appeal of Houdini was a lot of the positivity yeah. and you know, even one love, even one love is being thankful, you know. So what lyrically and stylistically made that the angle you guys like to pursue? Well, what happened with that is you got to look at, um, it was a, a big uh, problem with drugs in New York. So when we put that out, they say, let's, let's do something, a song that will get these people attention and and really t- tell them to stop using drugs. And we did a campaign with the mayor, you know, in, in New York. And um, we went down to City Hall. Everybody came down and, and um, wound up doing the video. We had Lawrence Fishburne in it. We had Carl Payne. And um, it was a great video. They had it in all the schools, you know, so they know the drugs, who need it, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's a... It's, uh very positive thing and this is something that i always am uh intrigued about because in this era of rap and even for the next couple years we still the artists were very clear that they were uh anti-drug 
don't do drugs, this is bad. And this is, yeah. you know, Melly Mel saying it. This is you guys saying it. This is, uh, you know, even Easy e and NWA were saying, <laughs> you know, it was uh, EPMD, Public Enemy. There were so many people, Rob Bass. And then, mm -hmm. obviously, it switched a few years later. But I also know at the same time, of course, a lot of people were using the drugs behind the scenes, you know, in their own lives. Mm -hmm. So yeah. how, how do you think that, that that balance of some people publicly uh, – There you go. Yeah, what you say? Yeah, yeah, I got you. So I was just saying, like, publicly, it was very positive, but a lot of people were dealing, you know, with, with their own demons behind the scenes. How do you think they were able to kind of keep that separate? I, I mean, you know, I'm not going to hide nothing. You know, back then, everybody back in the 80s had dealt with it a little something. You know, it was like almost like a social drug. You know, and if you be in a, a club like the Roxy's or, 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 or Studio 54, you come in there, you see everybody doing a little something in there. But they, that's the way it was going on. It was the end thing. But, you know, after a while, you see what it's done to people to take you out of here. So, you know, after that, you push that to the side. It's time to go forward, you know? Right. Okay. And then uh, the, the good part, I thought, was Back in Black was a Granted, it's not the last with the mega mix, but it was like toward the end of the album. And every it was the end of the album to me, really. But uh, that was another one of those like feel good, feel good moments. And I wanted to explain like on a performance side, but also on the music side. Like you were saying, Run DMC was so hard by comparison. LL was so hard by comparison. You guys were different. How how um, even though rap was trending harder how did you guys feel like you were able to sustain this this vibe for so many years and keep it going um we owe it to the fans it was big supporters and you know they brought out albums and um we had to do so much promotion we had to do in stores and in the malls record shops you know and we had to please everybody you know and um hard work when you got hard work and you're doing hard work, your record is going to sell. You know, today, these guys, they might do a little bit, but a lot of them don't even go to the radio station. They're just doing it off the internet. We didn't have the internet back then. So you had to do the promotion yourself. A lot of legwork, a lot of footwork. Right. And I think, too, when we get to Open Sesame, that legwork clearly had paid off at that point. But also with Millie Jackson, like, oh, as a kid yourself. Yeah, I got to get my plug because my phone made me go there. Yeah, um, Millie Jackson was incredible on that song. Yeah, and I was you know? uh, because of course, a there weren't that many collaborations in '87 at that point. But on top of that, yeah, uh, you know, I guess Shaka Khan was probably the biggest one with "Feel for You." But um, what what was it like for you guys to actually be able to do that collaboration? <laughs> Oh, it was incredible. We were so happy. We were just happy, too, to get another video. <laughs> That's what I was feeling. You know, we had Millie Jackson on it. We got another video. We're going to sell some records. And, and we wouldn't go. Yeah. I mean, that, yeah. that, to me, huh? that to me is one of the amazing things to come out in 82 and then album in 83 and still be going gold in 87, which was yeah. an eternity and rap in particular to me was mm -hmm. uh it was so crazy <laughs> yeah 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 but it but it was all it was all good it felt good especially to get your plaque you know absolutely i mm -hmm. i i got a few out of thanks but i, I didn't get one from making them <laughs> so <laughs> where you get it from man i got uh i got a lot actually i got uh Noriega, I got uh, Scarface, uh, Do or Die, oh. Little John, India Ari. I got I got quite a few. Wow, I got a lot. That's incredible. Yeah, man, I got Yin Yang Twins. I got a whole bunch. So oh, okay, so yeah. you good to go? Yeah, I got a lot. You look like NCA. You look like NCA Records, huh? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Nappy, Nappy Roots gave me one. I got so many, man. I got so many. 
It's a blessing, man. Like you to be able to. Yeah, do you play a love. big part. Yeah, to 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 do what you love and then to be appreciated for it is an amazing feeling. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. Yeah, man, you mean a lot to hip hop. Well, thank you. That means a lot coming from you. So thank you, man. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, now with with Open Sesame, that that is the the last album on Jive, of course. So what? You guys had a huge run, first uh, rap group to go platinum, had so many, you know, several gold albums, hit records, toured around the world mm -hmm. early in the game. So mm -hmm. did your contract just run out? Did you guys not agree artistically anymore? Like, what's happening? Yeah, we, we, we just, you know, called it quits with them. You know, it wasn't going for us no more. And they figured it, you know, Jalo was right and they wanted him to write. And Jalo felt, you know, they, they owed more advance. And um, they didn't want to come through. So he said, well, we're going to move on. And then we moved on. That's when we went to um, MCA Records. Right. And, and what, that was a big jump. Well, go ahead. I'm sorry. I said that was a big jump to go to MCA Records. Yeah. You know, it, it, was a it was a major label. And, at that time, we went and we signed for $2 million. You know, at that time, and no rappers was getting no money like that. But then we had the problem because the pop division signed us. And then we had to go to the to, to the R&B side. And they were like, well, you signed them. Y'all should push them. So I knew it was going to be a problem then. Because then you got to think about they got Patti LaBelle getting ready to come out. You got New Edition getting ready to come out. You got Bobby Brown getting ready to come I said, oh, oh. I think we get ready to get shelved. And we got one video out of it, and that was it. Well, uh, that leads me to a lot of questions, but one thing that you've mentioned and that I know and remember was how important videos were to sell records. And I think yes. a, lot of, a lot of people now, because videos are, and songs are so easy to make, they don't mm -hmm. understand or appreciate the impact of a video. So mm -hmm. I wanted you to explain Granted, that was 91 with Bag of Tricks, but in the early to mid 80s, through all the way through Open Sesame, how significant and what you noticed the videos did that put you guys in a different stratosphere? Um, like I said before, we were before our time because groups wasn't getting videos. If they did get one, they might have had a single and it was buzzing a little bit, so they gave them a little cheap video. Man, we had the works. We got like, I think it was two videos, and they gave gave us a discount. I think two videos for like thirty five thousand back then, and and that was one love, and that's when we did um, freaks come out at night. So we we was good for two videos, and um, that's when they really got a chance to see the group. You know, now you see us on screen. You used to see us in concert. Now you see us on screen, but we owe it to BET. BET really pushed us. And Video Music Box, Ralph McDaniels pushed us because back then um, MTV wouldn't play R&B. Just be straight up. They wouldn't play black videos. I was going to say, then. it was bigger than just R&B. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we had to be somebody like uh, uh, one of the rock groups to get played. Yeah, they, they wouldn't play us. Well, but they played Run DMC. Be sure to check out the history of gangster rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of gangster rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The history of gangster rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. I'm 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. There will be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that five on your TV basketball? Yo MTV it just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. There's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.